Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I'm your host, Wendy Nystrom. Today's special guest is Neil Vesavada. He is the owner and founder and CEO of Overdrive Energy Solutions. So welcome to the show, Neil. Thank you, Wendy. Also, a quick shout out to my co-founders um, and co-owners, Boxer and uh, and Sean as well. Don't want to leave them out of this. So I tend Absolutely. to be the voice. Absolutely. No, and it's I love what you're doing, but... um. Because you and I have had many conversations about what Overdrive does. But before we dive in, I love your background. You have a very cool background in energy and tech and entertainment and motorsports. So if you want to tell people about that transition in life to getting into um, renewable energies. Absolutely. You know, um, I find it fascinating as anyone because I, I didn't plan this. You know, a lot of the people who are in these industries are people who had lifelong passions for them and started at a very early age. Um, I did have lifelong passions for these things. I think I never believed that I could make a career out of them. So, you know, they were hobbies. And, um, and you know, it started, I grew up in, in the Chicago area as, um, as, as a car guy. You know, I love playing with cars and motorcycles and all the things you hear taking apart small engines when I was a, a kid, maybe sometimes getting it back together, um, you know, and then went to engineering school and um, did all the, the, the things that kids that grew up loving cars um, often do. Yeah. In, you know, very early in my college career, um, sometime, I think 1993, I got involved with this new technology that was fascinating to me, hybrid electric vehicles. Um, and this is before even the Prius was for sale in the United States. There were some US Department of Energy sponsored programs, student competitions around this. Um, and so working on these things, you know, fairly early on it was just absolutely fascinating. You know, something somebody said about electric cars to me way back then, you know, in the early 90s was, was these things are better. They're, 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 they make better cars in every single way. We just don't make long enough extension cords. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they were right even back then. Battery capacity yeah. and charging those batteries was all of the problem. And yeah. if you took a couple steps back, even in the early 90s, electric vehicles did absolutely everything that you would want a car to do better than their diesel or gas alternative except for the fact that they did not have the range and it took them a long time to charge. Yeah. Um, so it was an interesting insight, but then again, we still found use cases where they made a lot of sense. And in fact, that first you know use case where they made a lot of sense was these hybrid cars, which, is not, which are now ubiquitous these days. Let's be clear, hybrid electric cars, and by the way, fuel cell cars are electric cars. Yeah. They just have different ways than just storing energy in a battery to charge and store energy. In the case of a hybrid electric vehicle, we're using a diesel or a gasoline power plant to put energy in a battery. In the case of hydrogen fuel cell, we're using a hydrogen fuel cell to put energy in a battery. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, those, those, those technologies have been around for a long time and they're proven to work. So anyway, fast forward to, um, you know, I was always into music. I was into music just in the same sort of way everyone was. I was a very, very bad uh, guitarist and bassist who learned exactly how much he needed to play frat parties at the University of Wisconsin. Four um, chords. <laughs> <laughs> if that, you know, um, but but a lifelong music fan. And, and, and you know, it's kind of funny because sometimes even to this day, after after I've, I've spent, you know, more than a dozen years in live, live music, um, uh, you get around spaces where it's not cool to be a fan. And I've been a fan since I was a kid. And there's a, there's a picture of me at four years old in a gray leisure suit holding fat Saturday Night Fever, the album, you know? Um, and, uh, and it's been with me ever since. So I am one of the luckiest people I know. I didn't sacrifice and plan for years to crawl myself into this business. But somehow I accidentally ended up being in cars and rock and roll, two of my favorite things in the world. Um, awesome. I've also learned the, the, the dangers of destroying your hobbies, but 
uh, you know, by, by working in them. But in all seriousness, I think that this background is what gave me the perspective to do what we're doing today, which is bringing sustainable event energy into live events. From the very beginning, an understanding of first principles, like, you know, where do they make the most sense right now? Where will they make the most sense in the future? And how do we get there? Right? With the, even in the early nineties, we had these electric vehicles. We're like, God, these things do make sense when we pair them with a, with a gasoline engine. And Toyota's actually doing that. And they're coming out with this thing called the Prius. Have you, Wendy, yes. have you ever seen, and I don't know if you'd recognize one, but a first generation Prius on the roads in Southern California? Um, I know that they were very boxy. They but, were they um, were boxy. They weren't they weren't quite the teardrop shape that the new ones were. Yeah, they were kind of square, but I um, see. flat on the end and kind of. Trying. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and and you know you see them on the road here in Southern California still, which should yeah. blow people's minds. I mean, here there's oh, no. nothing when you look at a Prius from from a mechanical point of view, it doesn't look anything like a car from beforehand. I mean, the engine isn't even connected to the wheels really, but I mean, it is, but through a planetary gear set, which is something that we don't do. I mean, we use an automatic transmissions, I think in the forties and fifties, but just like mechanically the bits and bobs and everything are pretty darn different. I didn't know that. That's kind of they're, cool. they're, 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 they're very, and the way that they're implemented and the things that had to be created and everything. And what blows me away is that first generation Prius is the first attempt to sell them are just old freaking cars now. The people driving around Southern California have no idea how in left field this thing would look like to an automotive engineer in 1988, you know? Oh, yeah. Yet they're just boring old cars. And yeah, I think that that um, that goes to show you how effective, how, how, how realistic um, this, way of moving things with electric motors and batteries uh, is if the first attempt out of the box can 30 years later just be the car that someone's driving because they, they can't afford a new one and this one still works, it must say something about the technology. It's amazing technology. And um, so you grew up in Chicago. I grew up outside of Detroit. So I am a car girl in and out. And um, my personal knowledge, electric vehicles go back to the 1900s because women preferred electric vehicles because they were quieter than the um, petroleum run ones. And then there were also cars that were run on steam. The Stanley Steamer wasn't just a cleaning company. There was a vehicle called a Stanley Steamer and it ran on steam. So this energy diversification is necessary and it's just kind of fluctuated and ebbed and flowed, but we're now seeing it take traction. We're now seeing the technology catch up and the innovativeness catch up. So it's becoming more normalized. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if anything, um, a little side effect of this is that we've given gasoline and diesel power generation technologies and motor vehicle trans you know, powered technologies, a hundred year head start to make them look like they're really good. And another thing that should cause, you know, that that's reason for pause is that with a hundred years of practice of doing it right, doing it the best they can, these new electric vehicles are performing so much better in so many metrics compared oh, yes. to internal combustion engines. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm the technology. I'm, I'm personally excited about all the new developments and all the changes. And you and I talked recently about, you know, which are the really good um, electric cars out there, the hybrid ones, the hydrogen ones. We need it all. We need the diversification. Um, and that's the important side for the transportation, because I do know that when you work in live events and the energy consumed during those events, it's in addition to the transportation. It's actually running the electricity to get the stage lit. And you're usually in places that um, don't have a really reliable source of electricity. <laughs> Wendy, bringing... what's crazy is that we're often in places that have a really reliable source of electricity. And I'll address that. And I'm in oh, a little bit. <laughs> oh, I thought you're like in the middle field of nowhere. And I'm like, man, you're Some, you're bringing all this often, in. Often, but but not always. And in fact, it'd be interesting to figure out exactly how often. Um, but you know, just a few other things about my background is hmm. that after school, I got um, you know, I am I'm not the best employee. I lasted all of two years um, working for someone else before I started my own company, something called Apex B Technology, where we were 
providing um, data acquisition gear and control computers for motorsports, research and development, and other areas in the automotive world. And, you know, in motorsports, well, first of all, um, I certainly have burnt enough and added enough CO2 in my motorsports career uh, that I've got some atonement to do, which is good that I'm doing this. But I also learned something very interesting in that in that field, right? And at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to be efficient even in motorsports. We're trying to make the most amount of power in the smallest, lightest package. We're trying to make it reliable under harsh conditions and things like that. And yeah. so I had the opportunity to be at the bleeding edge of internal combustion engine development. And I got to tell you, it wasn't that impressive. It's impressive to engineers at first because you're like, holy cow, I can't believe, wait, wait, I got this. We can reduce emissions significantly by adding a high pressure direct injection system that operates in the thousandths of a millisecond that injects into a chamber that has been built with, with, with AI computer analysis tools. And then we have that exhaust go into an after treatment system where a very, very careful amount of, 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 of a chemical called urea is injected into it to help cause those diesel particulates. That, and then you go on and on and you're like, wow, that's a lot of impressive technology. It sounds like a Rue Goldberg machine, which it is. Um, modern internal combustion engines, and I have direct experience this because I was the one writing the code and installing the hardware to try to make them cleaner, are, aren't all that great at actually generating power. And the amount of energy, time, and, um, and money that has gone into the research and development, all the other things to try to make them do the job that the best they can, really stops making sense when you learn more and more about electrification. During my time at Apex, um, Tesla at a very early stage became a customer of ours. We helped them with data acquisition systems, um, I believe during the Roadster program, even a very early Model S development. Um, we worked with zero electric motorcycles as well. We worked directly with the university, with the, I'm sorry, with the um, US Department of Energy providing data systems for their pro progressive uh, X Prize, um, automotive X Prize, which was a vehicle fuel economy uh, competition that involved a lot of hybrid electric vehicles and things like that. Um, so I had exposure to it this entire time. Um, and then life gives you funny little turns. And oh. during the 2008 to 2012 um, recession, motorsports, which was where we got most of our revenue, really took a dive. A friend of mine asked me to help them out with a business and live events. One thing led to another, and I uh, started a 12-year career in um, uh, stadium touring and large venue like, like uh, music festival. Oh, wow. kind of production, providing a lot of gear that is related to event safety, also doing business development where I was taking equipment that was designed and being used in live events and using the live events field to find broader markets for them and broader applications. Very cool. And then the pandemic happened. And well, yeah. Everything that I've spoken about up to this happened, point, but... it all kind of came together, you know, um, it was a happy accident. I think I'm the only idiot on this planet with that weird mix of backgrounds and experiences. But it all ended up with, with the energy storage capacity that we now have and the capabilities that we now have, that we've learned since the early 90s, with the cost being what they are. Yeah. And with the requirements in the, in the live events industry or really anywhere where we use portable power um, being what they are, it really looked like these systems that I started working with back in the early 90s could do the job and potentially better than when we were doing it with diesel and gasoline generators. We started experimenting, playing around with things, had some small opportunities, and then exploded. It just went, it's, it's been out of the ballpark uh, yeah. since for about two years. We started, our first event was a movie night on the beach in Santa Monica with a fitness group. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> in 18 months uh, from that point, we did the largest sustainably powered um, mu uh, concert in U.S. history, where we provided uh, uh, some of the power for Billie Eilish's headliner set 
at Lala oh. Place in Chicago. So it took, it, it really that just took very April. Short of time it was scale. a very short period of time. And, and since the beginning of 2023, we have, I, I don't even have the actual numbers. My, if I, I guess right now we're probably at uh, close to 10 megawatt hours of sustainable energy deployed, probably close to 10,000 gallons of diesel avoided. We've mm -hmm. done events such as, you know, I'll tell you this year so far, um, we started with, uh, well, we've done South by Southwest. It was the largest sustainable energy activation they've ever had there. We did Willie Nelson's Luck Reading for the second year in a row. Last Sorry. year it was the largest sustainably powered stage ever done. This year it was the largest diesel free festival um, in US history that we know of. It's hard to say because there's not a lot of data on this stuff. Um, yeah. We went from there, we have, we have done pretty much all of AEG Golden Voices events in Southern California, including Coachella and Stagecoach. We did Google I.O., their largest developer conference in North America, thousands of gallons of fuel um, uh, saved. I just finished the reporting this weekend on that. Um, and what's also fascinating is every client that we did last year, in our first year of business, our first year of really doing events, every single client that we've, we worked with has come back and come back bigger. Um, that's, that's your so, calling card right there. So that is that's, a huge reference. <laughs> so I think that the reasons for this are simply that we're looking at things through a different lens than just about anyone who provides power. We're looking at it with both that first principles, academic lab-based knowledge of how electricity is generated and stored. And we're also looking at it as the, um, you know, from the engineering point of view of how it's used. And we're looking at it at the concerts festival, um, you know, eye of um, how it's deployed, um, how, how it's deployed, how the logistics work, um, what the use cases require, et cetera. And having all of these different skill sets has propelled us to the front where we are activating larger and larger and larger, the largest sustainable energy activation ever done in live events. We are, on these sites side by side with the largest diesel engine rental mm -hmm. deployment companies in the world. Oh, wow. And we're providing similar amounts of power in similar applications mm -hmm. in a very short amount of time. And I think this tells a lot about the potential for battery um, power stations and energy storage systems in order to really um, foster energy independence and democratize power and being on your podcast, the Environmental Social Justice Podcast, you know, that's one of the reasons why, because this isn't just about rock and roll. Thank you. Sustainable energy systems have the potential to increase access to power um, for a, across a wide spectrum of mm -hmm. our, uh, of our planet, really. Um, and live events has the potential to share and show this message and help people understand that we no longer are constrained by, let's call it legacy power suppliers, whether that's a utility, whether it's your landlord, whether it is um, a diesel generator rental company, whether it's an equipment rental company that, that, that rents batteries and, and other assets as well. You know, we don't have to be tied to a service provider per se, or there's yeah. ways for us to reduce that dependence. And I love the fact when you talked about um, the social justice, environmental and social justice, um, a lot of people don't realize just how much pollution is created from diesel generators. Um, they make a lot of pollution and people call it emissions, which sounds kind of almost soft and easy and friendly. Pollution, let's just call it what it is. <laughs> And it's usually, you know, in certain neighborhoods that large venues are, are housed or events take place. And that kind of pollution rains down on these communities. And by providing clean energy, you are removing that peril or that risk from that neighborhood. Not only that, Wendy, but this is some of the dirtiest stuff that we have working in our country today. The yeah. diesel generators that are primarily used for events don't have the emissions control requirements of no, that's good to know. passenger <laughs> cars or the commercial freight trucks. 
Um, you know, I wonder how it compares to things like shipping. You know, um, they're pretty, pretty, uh, they're they're pretty polluting to start with, and yeah. then what's worse is that they're used very inefficiently in live events, in film and TV, and a lot of other places. So that's another scary thing we 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 learned quickly is when you look at a spec sheet and you say this is how much it's supposed to pollute. And of course, there's parameters there. You don't, you know, everyone listening to this podcast probably understands that their car is going to use more fuel if they're going faster than if they're going slower, that their car is going to use more fuel if I'm driving it than if you are, Wendy, because well, you don't know my driving. Um, and, I'm not good. <laughs> and at the same time, the way that we use diesel generators for temporary power in most of the endeavors around entertainment is actually much, much less efficient than what those spec sheets and everything tell us. So yeah, yeah it's it's a problem. And, and you know, you mentioned stakeholders now. So I, I just want to go on that for a second bit. Like, you know, think about this, you know, this, these concentric circles of stakeholders. And you just talked about the big one, the community, the city around that stadium, right? Yeah. But what about the event workers who, mm. They, 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 you know, we live in a sea of diesel exhaust emissions all day, every day. What again, you know, people, the temporary workers for the events, the people who work full time at these venues, there are, um, you know, venues who, who, who bring in supplemental power all the time. Um, what about, uh, you know, you, you go all the way down to the safety things. Um, when you run generators and everything like that, you have to run a lot of cabling and stuff, cable ramps. Um, are a big deal, right? We were at a at the event safety summit in, I think it was 2021, and there was a speaker from the Kennedy Center, uh, their director of uh, of accessibility, I think uh, was her title, who was who was giving a speech. Uh, one of the questions was, "What was the number one thing a venue can do to improve accessibility?" Her answer was, "Get rid of cable ramps." So, I don't think I know what a who, cable ramp. A cable is. ramp is it's those plastic things that are on the ground that you run wires oh, over yeah, and then yeah, you gotta yeah, the, and and they have ADA cable ramps. Please ask any wheelchair user how pleasant it is to have to go over one of those things time and time again. So the stakeholders for um for the benefits the of of electrification are much broader than we we would have even thought. It goes all the way from people with you know ADA accessibility issues to you know people living in the local community. That is very important. I mean, I love the fact you're, you're you are actually thinking of the full circle, full breadth of the situation of everybody in that community and around it. And most people would not think of the workers. Most people would think that um, it just doesn't come to mind the people that put this together day in and day out and make it happen. The people behind the scenes that do ninety nine point nine percent of the work, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then the singer comes out, does their thing, and then they leave, and then the guys have to come back and take everything down. These are the guys exposed to that constantly that is chronic exposure well not just them we've actually gotten comments from artists about the diesel fumes on stage and the diesel fumes on artist villages um some of these performers well all these performers are at the top of their game and you can't underestimate the importance of some of them or to some of them of their voice and the quality yeah. of their voice and their ability to perform and i've had at least one performer one well-known household name level performer comment on how they stay away from certain areas during festivals because they don't want the diesel to yeah. harm their voice before they they perform oh absolutely it's the it's their most important asset they have to protect it i totally get that um now we've talked a lot about events and festivals and um venues you are also capable of offering this anywhere. I mean, it's not just a music thing for you. I was actually thinking with all the wildfires that popped up today and last night, resiliency and providing stable electric electricity to run pumps is very important for wildfire, for fighting wildfires, but also resiliency after a wildfire. Is that something that you can bring your system into and, and help people recover? It's already being done. Um, already we, have a, we, we have a we we have a a good friend of ours and uh, and a partner is a footprint project, footprintproject.org, or a nonprofit that um, specifically deploys the um, renewable energy systems for power in disaster areas. So they've 
dealt with the California wildfires. They've dealt with um, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes. And they're based in New Orleans. And whenever there is a natural disaster, they're usually, you know, on the road with portable solar arrays, battery systems, and everything like that to get power up and going as quickly as possible. Overdrive, we've worked with them on events before, and we've also discussed with them how we can start um, taking our gear as we grow and as you know, um, you know, things develop. Can our gear either be flowed down to nonprofits and other organizations for that kind of work? Um, or is your utilization play involved here? Because, you know, live events, outdoor live events are primarily April through October. And hurricane yeah. season, by the way, just happens to be the exact opposite, yeah, right? So I think there's a, there, there's a potential for um, a lot of this. And that brings into play something, you know, that in, in the rental business we call utilization. Right. Um, in any kind of business like this, you want that thing to be used as much as possible. Right. And and uh, whenever you have something big and expensive that 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 is part of your revenue stream, whether it's an airplane or a taxi or in our case, a renewable energy system. But there is a significant difference in renewable energy systems versus typical power systems. Um, huh. So our systems, our batteries and by the way, people aren't familiar with a lot of these things. Um, no, not at all. That's there's, why there's, we're talking. There's a, there's a huge <laughs> change. Well, a lot of the things I'm going to say now, there's a huge, there's been a huge change in battery technology in just the last five to 10 years that I mm -hmm. don't think people have fully grasped. Um, so this formulation is out now. One of the most common and popular is called LFE or uh, lithium iron phosphate that mm -hmm have rewritten the playbook on batteries that you and I and other people grew up with. What do I mean by that? First of all, the, the, the degradation is very slow. We all remember that cell phone, that laptop, whatever, they got thrown away, not because it didn't work well enough, but because the battery started to suck. Um, these batteries are actually rated by the manufacturers to work in our use cases, 10 to 15 years. The wow. rest of the parts in our systems, they don't really have any moving parts. There might be, a small computer sized cooling fan or something like that. But the rest of the components, there's something called an inverter. You know, there's wiring that goes in between. Um, there's a battery systems, even solar panels. None of these things really wear out by using them. I mean, technically they do, but you know, what's funny is when they, when they, you know how they define end of life for the batteries is when they're 80% of capacity. So we're yeah. not even saying that in 10 to 15 years, they're going to be thrown out or recycled. It just means that you got to get 20% more to get the same result as you did when they were new. Um, well, what does this mean in terms of that utilization thing? It means that it costs overdrive very little to give these assets to someone like Footprint Project for them to use during hurricane season because it's not like they're wearing it out. It's not like they're decreasing the service life. You know, of course, physical damage, breakage, things like that happen when you transport things, accidents happen, stuff like that. But in general, we can use this gear aggressively to provide energy wherever it wants without worrying as much about limiting the life of the gear or it's from a, from a business point of view, diluting its ability to make revenue when we do have our core customers. And I do believe, um, cause I did visit your website. Um, these, these batteries are modular. So when something does break, you can just pull that one little piece out and replace it rather than having to redo the whole thing. So it is actually quite, um, mobile. I mean, it's well, that's, that is an innovation that I think differentiates us from the majority of sustainable energy companies and the majority of battery infrastructure companies. And that is as much about our system design and how our unique backgrounds led to that as much as it is the batteries. First of all, batteries are by nature modular. Um, and by that, I mean, you know what you have to do to make a battery pack twice the size of its existing size, get two of them and hook them up. Put it in half, <laughs> put it in half in the right spot. And that's it. I mean, 
you can't do that with well so so let me give you let me give you and your audience an analogy moving forward okay <laughs> well, i'm going to talk about two main components one is the battery which in your car is going to be the gas tank all right how much you put in it is how far you can go how long it takes you to fill that gas tank is your charge time um the inverter is the engine okay yeah. The inverter is what drives the car. It's what makes the power, all right? So we have an engine and we have a fuel tank. Well, again, unlike the automotive world, we can cut our engines and our fuel tanks apart and we can recombine them and put them back together very quickly in order to accomplish what we need. So yeah. the batteries, it's not just that. So fundamentally, from the get-go, all this stuff is modular, but then we take advantage of that and how we build this. We build them. And by the way, this is this is an innovation that Overdrive is really leaning on. It's not happening in the larger uh, diesel generator portable power world as much as we'd like to see it. Um, we're making systems that instead of trying to figure out what the power needs are and ordering the appropriate system, we can show up somewhere with a rough idea what the power needs are and just add inverters and add batteries to get the result we need. I mean, it's as if you were going to drive, oh, I got to tow a trailer this weekend. Can someone go in the garage and get the second engine and hook it up? Yeah, you know what? There's going to be, we're towing a trailer and there's a really long stretch of road between charging stops. Can someone go grab a second set of batteries, hook it up before we leave the garage? You know, it's That's like that. And what that lets us do is not worry about the truck that we're renting before we get the trailer. We get a truck that we know has that range and then we can adjust on site as needed. That's fantastic. Um, when you are um, just kind of wanted to revisit during the summer months when you're doing the tours and live events, but the other months you're helping with the hurricanes and the disaster relief, are there other entities for you to talk to municipalities or people? Because I, when I met you, it was actually at a conference and you supplied the renewable energy for that conference. And um, so you, you were able to pretty much go anywhere. You can you can supply energy large scale small scale it doesn't have to be a giant venue I don't believe you can actually do other smaller things too so people have options. Our focus is anywhere where your people are using diesel or gasoline generators, um, and the focus of overdrive isn't live events per se. That's where we're starting because that's where we have the experience and also live events is a great place to develop stuff. It is a it's it's sort of a a repetitive thing. We do the same thing over and over again in a known closed system, right? So for engineering development, that's great. And we're highly visible. I mean, oh, it's just... really, even in the two years that little old overdrive has been doing this, you know, we have undeniably created situations where we can point to and yeah. others are pointing to and people that we don't even know are starting to point to and saying they did it over there. And there's data published openly that shows how they did it. And by the way, there was 100,000 people there. So it's, we're pretty sure it really happened. This isn't a moon landing <laughs> in a studio kind of moment here, folks. You know, why isn't it happening more? And that's what live events help us do, allow us to do. Yeah. But let's get back to your question. Um, I actually believe that the real benefit to this is um, in our local communities. Uh, right now, one of the things that Overdrive is, is really focused on is not the rest of the concert season because we have we know those people. We're proving yeah. our worth there, and they're coming to us. It really is, you know. I've, I'm emphatic that in our cities, in our municipalities, we should not be using diesel or gasoline generators. Let me give you some 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 very very direct examples of why this is a perfect perfect approach for municipalities and things like that. The first thing is already we're at the point with battery capacities and things like that. When we deploy, we typically deploy with enough energy for a full day's runtime. Okay. So most of the events in our municipal worlds are a day or less, right? There's a farmer's market. Uh, there's a holiday concert in Venice. Yeah. Uh, at Windward Circle, there's you know events at the Santa Monica Pier. I'm a West Sider, so I have no idea what happens east of uh, the 405. Apologies. Um, you do not travel that. You do not go <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but but you know all of these things. The battery inverter approach is actually 
easier to implement. Um, it's cost competitive, if not cheaper, when you look at the cost of, of diesel and all the logistics involved in, in using diesel generators. They have to be much further away from what you're powering because of the noise and the fumes, the fire hazards and things like that. You know, they need to be, um, uh, they need to be protected from people. If I could snap my fingers and every event that was less than a day in the Los Angeles area was run by battery inverter systems, I am at this point very confident that we would actually see an increase in reliability and a net decrease in cost. And I know that's some pretty, pretty bold things to say, but we have got two years now of data from some of the most time sensitive and and uh, and demanding applications that you can have for this stuff. Yeah. If also the pollution this, aspect, you're reducing the, the pollution. I mean, the, I, I always talk about cost because that's what people love to, 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 to I know, say. it's oh, everyone's cool friends. So, How but, much is this gonna cost me? <laughs> I am on a crusade to change that narrative. Sustainable energy is no more expensive the diesel and gas in the right use cases. I don't drive an F-350 dually crew cab to take my son two miles to school because that's the wrong tool for the use case, okay? Mm -hmm. We are driving a lot of F-350 dually crew cab pickup trucks to take our kids to school two miles away right now in energy, in events, in our cities. And there's simply no need. And operating in the live event space is giving us that proof of you know, the people. And we're really hoping that we're going to see that from people in our local community um, this coming year. I think it's absolutely necessary. I mean, first of all, the, the grid of reliability is important, something we don't really have a whole lot of. Um, and it's just infrastructure. It's older. So we, we do need to have alternatives. Personally, for me, I like the, the ability to make choices. I want to be able to choose what I use, when I use, how I use it, um, and what it's going to cost me, because that's pretty much, you know, there's no unknowns. You're told how much it will cost you per kilowatt hours or what this will be or what that will be. So these are important factors people need to keep in mind when they make these decisions. And we want to see these implemented when we throw around the term microgrids, just so people understand when we have disasters or something happens, if there's a blackout, an entire grid section goes down. But when you have smaller, reliable sources of these microgrids, which could be provided by overdrive, you will only lose a small portion of that one affected area. So an entire neighborhood or community won't be, you know, in the dark. And then that one area that is in the dark will get quickly fixed because it's. Wendy, much I got I got I, I, I hate to break this to you, but that's yeah. not entirely accurate. Oh, no. This is my, because, this is because, my dream world. Are you ready for this? Oh, you like the answer. I, I promise. Um, when that area goes down. It shouldn't go down. Oh, the whole the grid first place, we have it happen. Microgrids, if properly properly implemented sustainable energy systems, gives you resilience that I don't think people even understand. And let me explain, okay? Yeah. So our systems, the technology that overdrive has developed and uses these days, they're not just battery systems. They're something that I call, you know, energy aggregators, and I'll explain that in simpler terms in a second. And yeah. they're UPS systems. I'll explain that in a second too. What does that mean? We collect energy from everything available. So we okay. can take solar. We can take grid energy. We can be plugged into the grid. We can take a generator. Our units have a um, have what's called a, U a universal power supply function with a fast transfer switch. If you have a sustainable energy system from overdrive that's connected to a grid, let's say, okay? okay. Um, but also has solar coming into it. Well, now we can be powered mostly by the solar, but if it's cloudy, it'll pull some information from the grid. If it's nighttime, it could pull it from the grid. And then you know what happens when the grid goes down? Nothing. The system takes over 100% because it has this transfer switch. It throws a warning, and then you have an hour or more to fix the problem without the power ever going down in the first place. And that's how we use sustainable energy systems to not just bring sustainability, but to increase resilience. There's nothing, I love this demo that we do at concerts all the time where we have the whole stage running and everything, and we're doing this. We're actually running our system in between other systems, and then I just throw the main breaker on the power supply. Freak and everybody. you watch everybody, <laughs> everybody, everybody, 
has some reaction except for the stage. Because the people on stage have no idea that it happened because it just keeps going. And why is this important? Well, again, we have this tool that has so much flexibility. Why not take advantage of it? And why not, why not show people that this is more than just sustainability? It's cost, it's reliability, it's safety. I was talking about the, the service life of the batteries. I forgot to leave one important point out that lithium iron phosphate batteries don't have the toxic materials that we associate with batteries. So next time someone throws some disinformation out at you about cobalt mines in Congo or whatever, that doesn't apply to the kind of technology that we're using for live events. Now, that does apply to many electric vehicles still because they have some special needs and, and they have to build batteries that can, that can perform in a different way than live events do. But this is not 100% the case. I believe uh, Ford Mustang Mach-E's and the standard range Tesla Model 3s and Model Ys also have lithium iron phosphate batteries. So mm -hmm. these batteries, not only at the end of their life, they have 80% of their range, but they're non-toxic and they're recyclable. So again, in all of these use cases, this is superior to using diesel generators. Um, oh, absolutely. And again, the cost, when you consider there are ways in which, because you can split up your generator and position it how you want, your installation cost, the labor required to put it down, goes yes. down. This has created some interesting problems, Wendy. Um, we're not, uh, to be blunt, we are not getting the traction in film and TV that I was hoping for. Um, how is it that we're doing so well in concerts? I live in LA and film and TV is a problem. Well, in some areas, labor plays a big role in how things are done. And in, you know, and, and the simple fact is that using electrification instead of generators reduces the amount of labor involved. Got it. And this has been openly discussed with us as one of the impediments. So a lot of the installations and things that we see here in our hometown, here in LA, in Hollywood, are overpriced, are overly complex because they have to keep a infrastructure that's based on what people on those sets have been doing for 50 years in place, whether it's efficient, reliable or not. Yeah. And I'm going to say another thing. Um, we haven't even broken into this yet, but I guess I just did. Um, you know, you were talking about municipalities and things. It sounds like a slam dunk, right? So far, and I haven't gotten very far. We have been very aggressive, but um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the sustainability department for the city of LA did respond to our request and said that PG&E handles all their power needs. Thank you very much. Um, one day I'll frame that email. Uh, we, I live here in the city of Santa Monica and I've gotten some really, really good inroads speaking with people with the city about the sustainability things. But the answer to sustainable power seems to be the vendors handle that, you know. So I know that there's here in Santa Monica, um, I don't believe you're allowed to use generators unpermitted in city parks or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I counted six of them on Saturday morning. Um, walking from my house to work out near the bottom of Ocean Park and, and the beach um, and yeah. back. Um, we are, there, there's a lot of, I think, good intentions, but not a lot of, of, uh, of work being done to push and incentivize people to use yeah. sustainable energy. And the reason why, Wendy, is because there's not enough of us. Right now, we keep fighting. <laughs> Overdrive has been sold out for better or worse since February. And we can't do, nobody can do a major event for, the, let's say, even the city of LA. If the city of LA wants to have an, an event that has 20,000 people, the only people who have to take the, the equipment to supply that are diesel generator rental companies. And what we're seeing from that space is when you ask them for sustainability, it's an add-on. Yeah. There was a major festival done by an outdoor related brand a couple weeks ago, and they had one of the largest um, generator suppliers uh, in, in the US provide them with their power. And this company 
likes to talk about how much they're investing in sustainability and they have all the sustainable assets and they deployed, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to say between eight and 15 battery systems with diesel generators right next to them. Oh my. And they used the diesel generators in a number of those spaces. They also, um, you know, they, they had all the expense and transport and all of that. They built a grid that used both diesel and uh, and the batteries, and it was horrendously complex. And I could see one arguing, well, this is a new technology. We don't really know it that well. It's not that reliable, but it is. Yeah. And we've been doing it. The very, I think the weekend after that, we did a, um, a similarly sized activation for AEG out in Pomona. Um, they had, you know, among the stuff we we're powering is 18 air conditioned office trailers in 90 plus degree heat. You know, oh. we had, oh, about 31 battery units there and not a drop of diesel and 100% uptime over six days. Love it. So if little old overdrive can do this, certainly the largest companies in the world can do it, but they're not. So what we now need is we need to do more of these activations year round. We have to, we, we want the municipalities and the communities and other people to see that this is a better way because somewhat selfishly, that's what helps us fundraise. That's what helps us scale because at this point, after two years, even though we're a tiny little company with really, really three, maybe four full-time employees, I earnestly believe that within a year, we can be competing toe to toe with traditional portable power companies. Um, and I think that our body of work up to this point is, you know, is proof. Absolutely. No, I, I, I you know, when you talk about your venues, just the fact you've done Coachella, Lollapalooza, you did the Willie Nelson concert, you did Billie Eilish, you've done all these things. These are large scale venues that require a ton of energy. And the fact that you've been able to provide this energy without a hiccup, without inter interruption or interference or downtime, that is um, very telling of your capabilities and success, that you are able to do this pretty flawlessly and easily. And personally, from my standpoint, I would love to see this in municipalities where we do have choices and that we, um, you know, when there's a storm or when the wind blows too much and they have to shut everything down because they're worried about wildfires, we, we need a backup, we need an alternative, we need an option. And well, that's just my personal selfishness right there. I don't know if we need a backup or alternative. I think this should be the, I think the backup or alternative is already here. And that's it the, is. It, yeah. Just, <laughs> just if you can't the get the battery to work, then you yeah. can go to the diesel. But the battery is the more, I, I, was, I was being a little facetious, Wendy. I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying that the technology is so good at this point, it doesn't yeah. have to play second fiddle to what we're doing with diesel power generation. And I wanna be very transparent about a few things here, okay? Let's talk yeah. about Billie Eilish for a second. We only did what was called the artist floor package for Billie Eilish. That's the stuff that she brings special for her set at Lollapalooza, which obviously there are many bands there. We didn't do all the lights on the stage or all the video or anything because okay. we weren't allowed to. Hmm. And you know what? I get it, no, 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 I get it. It was the first <laughs> thing of that size of that scale ever done so they were taking it very cautiously. And, and my estimate is that the part that we did probably was between 15 and 25% of the total requirement. Mm -hmm. We ended that show mm -hmm. having used only 16% of the capability that we delivered. So what I'm saying is that we did the Billie Eilish show, we did as much as they allowed us to, but it turned out we could have done the whole thing and the headliner set for the next night with the equipment we brought. Um, even with these activations I'm talking about, you know, we're we're not doing main stages for the largest festivals yet. We've gotten like the independents, like like South by Southwest and Willie Nelson, uh, to work with us, and we've powered their stages flawlessly without issues. Um, yeah. You know, but the 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 reason I'm, I'm sharing this part with you is that the use is only going to grow. Um, everything I'm telling you here there's still space to grow. There's, there, 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 you know, there's, there, there's opportunities on the table. And yeah. right now the limitation is really how much gear we have and how, how many people we have, not what they're trying to power. I, I totally agree. And thank you for um, 
educating me on some of the things I did not understand. Um, but this is necessary. Oh, I don't mean to sound like that at all. No, Wendy. no this is, I, this, I learn from these shows. I do this for my own educational purpose. And I love learning exactly what people do because you can't always get it from a website or from when you and I had coffee. But um, more importantly, scaling up is important. Seeing more of what you do is important. Third thing, how do people find you? What is the best way for someone to reach out and say, Neil, I want to work with you. I want to hire you. Well, there's the simple you know, website, which is www.overdrive.rocks. Um, I, I recommend that you search the big socials, primarily LinkedIn and Facebook for Overdrive Energy Solutions. Um, it's not just about asking us, you know, of course, we, we'd love people to contact us for work, but I want your audience. And I want more people to see what we're doing because that's the biggest impediment across the industry right now is still skepticism about what can be done and how it can be done. And that's the education aspect. That is all we need to do is keep talking and letting people know it's this is not the energy of 20 years ago. This is changing continuously and constantly. We have new batteries, new types of batteries, how we're doing it, how we're generating it. That's what people need to understand. Before we wrap, there's yes. a practical application that has come, that has become um, more and more prevalent in what we're doing this year that I think I, that I wanted to share with you and your audience because people don't think about this very much. People in the live events industry know all about supplemental power. And if for those of you who aren't in the live events industry or may not be aware, you'd be surprised at how many things happen in buildings, in cities that still have a diesel generator attached to it. Oh, yes. And <laughs> there's a couple reasons. One is the belief that there's not enough power available. Um, you know, one thing about that is that the over just the last... 20 years, the amount of energy needed to run shows has changed dramatically. And what we're starting to see is that the power specification hasn't really responded. Um, LED lights and class D audio amplifiers use significantly lower amounts of energy than, uh, than they, has anyone noticed stages aren't hot anymore? We don't I have to that. worry about I our know, talent. I don't know about the power D thing. <laughs> well, well, think about it. We don't worry as much about talent under hot lights as we did. Yeah. Right. Was, yeah. Remember that used to be a big deal. The kind of makeup that they had to it wear just, and everything that because they're sweating right. and everything like that. That's not an issue anymore yet. We haven't. So, so first things first, you know, on Roger Waters tour that my business partners on um, the last tour, they were able to remove, eliminate supplemental generators a couple of tour stops just by looking at data and saying, um, we didn't need them. But here's another thing. Our gear that I was telling you about, that UPS function and everything, that's um, specifically designed to eliminate the need for supplemental generators. Um, here's something else I can do that's fascinating. We can take in power and boost it. So oh. um, I'll give you three real world examples of that. And, um, and, and this is, I think this is important for a lot of your audience to hear because this is the lowest of the hanging fruit. Just, it, it makes it cheaper, it makes it easier, it makes it safer. There's really no reason not to do this. Um, so what we can, at South by Southwest, uh, they had, you know, they had a stage line SL260, which is not a, a huge stage, um, but it's among, you know, it's it, you'd still see that size stage at a, at, a, at a festival or something like that. You know, definitely you see it for, for, for a lot of uh, uh, things outside like 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 holiday celebrations and, and things like that. And they had power right behind the stage, but it was only about a third of what they would need to run that stage. So wow. they usually bring a diesel generator. Yeah. What we did is we brought one of our systems and it constantly took a hundred amps from the power available and then it took from its batteries, which were maintained from solar, which by the way, wasn't even necessary. The solar was a great way to show off what it could do, but it could have worked without the solar. They, anytime that it needed more power than the services in the park would provide, it just got added onto it by the batteries in real time. All right, now that- That's impressive. That might sound a little out there, but let me give you an easier to digest version, okay? Um, 
Coachella, Coachella, there's a lot of parties that surround Coachella. We did two of them, the same concept. One was in a mansion in Palm Springs. It was the Capitol Records, Interscope Records, uh, Day in the Desert party. You know, high profile, lots of talent, lots of industry people. Um, it's in a house, it's in someone's mansion. They built a catering operation in the back in the driveway. I think they had five industrial refrigerators, you know, they had, uh, they, had, they had all sorts of kitchen equipment, fryers, warming cabinets, stuff like that. And, you know, all they had available to them was a regular outlet, regular home outlet, which is at maximum 20 amps. And they needed more than 50 to run this stuff. We put our box there, it's the size of a refrigerator, it plugs into the outlet and then everything plugs into it. And what it would do is when you had energy that was less than the outlet could provide, it routed that energy to the batteries and charged them. And then when it when when you needed more energy than the outlet could provide, it added that energy from the batteries. So the batteries were now a sponge. And what that let us do was That's you're on this entire catering operation off of one little um, one little uh, outlet, and at the end of the event, the batteries were still fully charged because they were just acting as a sponge. We did the same thing with a large, I think it was 10 by, no, eight by 16, I think. No, nah, I don't remember what the aspect ratio was, but a large video wall at a DJ event, same concept. It's a house. They don't have the kind of electrical wiring to run that video wall without blowing breakers all over the place. Put one of our units in and all of a sudden you can do that. Important thing to know is both of these events, actually all three of the events previously were bringing in supplemental generators. Next time you or any of your audience drives past Beverly Wilshire, look in their loading dock. I often see supplemental generators there. I don't know anyone there. I don't know what they do. I just know that there's diesel generators in their loading dock. And I guess that they feel that they need supplemental power for events. Well, they do events there quite frequently. Um, they have the giant ballroom and you know that's gonna need supplemental energy just to make that happen. Um, but we are approaching an hour. This is the longest interview I've done in probably three years. So this is pretty spectacular. And there's Mr. Chance, he decided to join us. There's Cleo is <laughs> back there somewhere. I'm sorry? Cleo is around here somewhere. She was uh, back yeah. there. I think she slinked out under the camera view. Um, yeah, no, he, thank he, you for he, your time, he, Wendy. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Anytime. No, this has been um, an enormous educational opportunity for me. So I know that other people are going to learn from this as well. But the need for supplemental energy and the need to do it correctly is what's important. And that's what overdrive is doing. That is what overdrive accomplishes. And that's what you guys do. And I think it's, I think what you're doing is wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, we look. I look forward to talking more and showing you and your audience more of what we can do. Absolutely. You know, I would love that. I would really love to get um, some footage. Maybe when we do this again, we'll get some footage of what it's like when people can actually see it, feel it, you know, get a get a look for it. That would be awesome. Well, there'll be a fun one at the end of this month. I think we're doing a Long Beach taco and beer fest or something like that. Two of um, my favorite foods. <laughs> well, we were based in Long Beach. We happen to know the production company that puts the stuff on. So we've been helping them out a lot. It's a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity for people to see our stuff. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't have all the details, but you Google it and I'm sure you'll find it. And uh, end of June, Long Beach um, taco. You're in tacos. See, two of my favorite things. So um, you may you might see me skulking around looking for you there. All right. Well, thanks again for your time and your audience as well. And uh, and look forward to talking the next time. Absolutely. Um, so thank you, Neil. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Please check out Overdrive Energy Solutions. It's very important stuff that they are doing. I'm Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice. We will check you out next time. Take care. Bye-bye.